Okay, so in the last podcast, I talked about metrics out of my Agile transformation. And I listed a few categories just off the top of my head. So between the last podcast and now, I had some time to sit down and really think about what those metrics meant. And I decided to split those metrics into two different categories. The two different categories would be metrics, throughput metrics that are valuable to the teams, valuable to the product owners or scrum masters or, or the managers, resource managers who are air quotes over those teams and the resources that are on those teams. And then the mirror, the other side of that are the behavioral or, or predictability focused metrics that a leadership team member would be interested in or, or potentially financial metrics that a leadership team would member would be interested in. For example, the, 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 the cost of an individual story point for an individual team. Let's say I have teams A, B, C, D, right? I have a four teams. Okay. And a story point of every team can be broken down based on the cost of the team over, over each sprint, just like you'll develop an average velocity, you'll develop an average cost of a story point for that team over time. So things like that, that may, that may be interesting at a leadership perspective. Let me start with the story flow rate. So we, a contentious topic on the podcast, and it probably shouldn't be as contentious as it is only because I feel like. And this is only my personal feeling, the, the no, the hashtag no estimates movement in agility kind of gets a, a bad name because I don't, I personally don't feel, and I've talked about this before. I personally don't feel that they've represented their cause very well, but the hashtag no estimates is about the number of stories that go through in a sprint rather than an estimation or some kind of forecast, actually using the number of stories that roll through as sort of a, a, a qualitative number to predict the number of stories that'll go through next sprint. So let's say, for example, this sprint, I did 42 points worth of stories. And next sprint, I do 45 points worth of stories. But this sprint, I do 10 stories. Next sprint, I do 11 stories. Sprint after that, I do nine stories. Then your average is probably going to be somewhere around 10 maybe 11, right? So they'll just use the number of stories that flow through. Just like if you weren't using story points at all and you were, and you just had a Kanban board and you weren't counting the number of stories that go through, you would, over time, you can count your flow rate. This is the metric I'm talking about. It, it directly correlates to velocity. You can easily say, well, if I did 10 stories and each is a five, then I did 50 per sprint or 50 or 55 per sprint. So my velocity is 55 and you could easily say, well, look, I could use my flow rate or I can use my velocity, but they're both the same number. It's just one is a factor of the other. Completely true. However, if you just use the number of stories that are flowing through, it's a little bit easier to aggregate up to the leadership level. And, and the argument against that is you shouldn't be aggregating the number of points or stories from sprint to sprint between teams, because that number is specific to the team. However, we all know that at a program level, it's going to happen in some way, shape or form. There are methodologies, say for example, that try to standardize the points across all the teams so that you can roll them up at a program level. So I would think if you're going to roll your flow rate for the team, up to a leadership level, then the thing that I would roll up would not be the actual story points. The thing that I would roll up would be the, the percentage amount of committed stories to delivered stories. So if you have a team that's constantly committing to 10, uh, to 10 stories, and then only delivering eight of those stories, then they have an 80% delivery rate. So maybe I would think about rolling delivery rate up to the leadership level. If we can compromise and not roll all of the throughput levels up to the leadership level, because throughput really doesn't mean very much at a leadership level. And I would like to, to take a step back and, and to think about rolling some sort of delivered business value up to the leadership level. But unless you're going to standardize business value, which quite honestly is a lot easier than standardizing flow rate. If you're going to standardize delivery of business value up to the leadership level, then the only thing I would caution is your product owners have to sort of standardize between them, maybe using some sort of 
community practice events or trainings or, or, or something like that, they would need to standardize to figure out a standard scale to use for business value. So l- let's let's put that one. In. So velocity story points. I wanted to address that one first and get it out of the way because that's going to be the the elephant in the room that would sit over me the whole time. So I would convert the story point flow slash velocity into committed versus delivered rates, and I would roll that up in an aggregate for the entire program. Okay. So the second thing is you we're looking at an organization that has decided you know we're gonna we're going to be an agile organization we're going to commit to the principles uh, of agility and i would expect that some sort of some sort of aggregate satisfaction would roll into the numbers into the metrics so that satisfaction can be split into two parts so you you're i would say if you go out and do a, a simple google search for uh, product satisfaction or whatever you're gonna you're gonna immediately run into net promoter score. I'm not talking about net promoter score for a minute. I'll talk about that in in, uh, in I'll let's talk about that in a second. Okay, let's focus internally for a second on how happy are your teams and how satisfied are your teams. Let's let's call it team satisfaction or happiness. I guess you could call it happiness, but. I could easily see members of the leadership scoff at using the term ha- happiness of team members. So we'll call it team satisfaction rating, which is how satisfied are your team members and developers, QA people, anyone who sits on a team, how satisfied are they with the output of their work, with the product of their work? So you can do this as a scrum master. You can do this by every day, giving the thumbs up, thumbs down uh, uh, chart for for people to go into when they go into their daily standup. Just, it takes two seconds, maybe maybe 10, 15 seconds for people to, to hit a link to go to a board, thumbs up, thumbs down. You could do, uh, I've also seen a happy face, indifferent face, frowny face, and they can click one of three each day. And, and then you can aggregate that up and add it up over time to show the satisfaction of your team members, whether they feel that they are contributing to the larger mission or vision of the work which uh, let me take that offline for a second because the, the the connecting your teams to the actual vision laid out by executives or leadership that's a larger than i'm talking about now so let, let me let me get through these and I'll, I, maybe i'll get back to that at the end um that is one that i've i've very rarely seen very rarely seen tracked which is how happy are your team members and how much do they feel that they are contributing to the overall vision and success of the of the company and all of the teams together, the program, right? All the teams together. So that would be one that I would think about tracking. Because if you were, let's say you were a program manager and you had three, four, five scrum masters working in the program under you, that would be an easy one to mandate. Hey, uh, look, listen, I, I want to start tracking the the how happy the team members are. Just have them hit this link. Maybe it's anonymous, you know, have them hit this link. And, and give them the thumbs up, thumbs down every day, how they're feeling about you know their, their contributions to the team and the, and the company. And you can record that off of the side and, and, and it can roll up pretty easily. That, that is one that can be standardized. It's super easy to sanitize that one. Roll it up to the, to the leadership level. Thumbs up, thumbs down every morning, whether you feel we're, you know, we're on track. And based on the results that you get, there should be some kind of other conversation that happens along the way. But that's something that lets people know, hey, we're on the right track. These are the right goals. We're giving the right feedback. We're looking at the right data. Everyone's kind of on the same page or not. Right. So that one can be used both at the team level and at the leadership level. That's a that's a that's a plus one. So the other side of team happiness is customer satisfaction. Now, how you measure customer satisfaction there's a whole discipline and, and there's a tons of different ways of measuring customer satisfaction. The net promoter score and NPS net promoter score, you'll probably see the most results for this one. And the net promoter score is pretty easy. You want to utilize the most powerful tactic publicizing your product, which is word of mouth. So you want to make sure that the number of people that are positive and, and spread the word about your product outweighs the number of people who are are detracting from your product so it's it's promoters versus detractors right that that and that will that will yield your net promoter so it's super easy to get 
you, you want to get the number of people that give positive reviews to your product and take away the number of people that give negative reviews to your product. And the people that are kind of in the middle are kind of nebulous, maybe. So, so sometimes you include them, sometimes you, you exclude them. It really depends. But figuring out what, what your net promoter score is, is more of an art than it is a science. And this is a, this is a fun, funny thing to say out loud. And you can go around the internet and search for different ways to get this. But the point at which you ask users for feedback can have a huge impact on your net promoter score. F for example, you might want to prompt to get your net promoter score after you use, uh, complete a successful transaction. A, a, a while ago, I was working on a mobile product and in the mobile product, we had situations where the customer would finish a transaction and the transaction was successful. And then the customer was sent some sort of, some sort of a confirmation that the transaction was successful and the action of that confirmation would trigger the survey to get their net promoter score, right? So obviously you wouldn't want to trigger the, the survey for the net promoter score if the transaction was not successful, because, uh, you know, I would expect the majority of time, if the user has to debug some kind of error or has to go back because uh, for example, I, I have on my phone, sometimes, uh, for banking, you have to take a picture of a check and when you have to take a picture of a check, sometimes that picture is not uh, successful. Sometimes the check comes out blurry or sometimes the check comes out kind of washed out, or maybe you didn't use a flash and sometimes it'll ask you to retake the photo of the check. So obviously after a, a process where you had to retake the picture of the check several times, you probably wouldn't want to ask for the user's feedback because they're frustrated. They had to throw out two, three different pictures and take them again. So the, where you ask for your feedback from your user is very important to determining your net promoter score. So pay attention not to ignore that. So the asking for customer feedback inside of your application, if you're in a larger company and e each transaction inside of your application is implemented by a different team, maybe each team's transaction needs to be judged individually. So uh, let's stick with financial for a second. If the team that deals with scanning and recording check visually, like I was talking about with, with taking a picture, if that team is completely different from the team who does uh, balance transfers, if I want to, oh, I want to move a thousand dollars from savings over to checking and, uh, you know, I go enter my numbers and, uh, you know, maybe I, I mess it up because the app wants decimals and I forget to put decimals in Wh whatever, you know, whatever it is, if that piece of the application is different from the uh, PC application where you were scanning a check, but you are prompting for user satisfaction, uh, user feedback, those teams and their pieces of their application after you take their feedback, they need to be kept separately. This assumes there are many touch points in your application that you're grabbing feedback, right? So I, I would just think about that because the, the, the larger net promoter score of the satisfaction in that case where you have separate, separate touch points where you gather the user's feedback, the, 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 the separate pieces need to be kept separately and then aggregated together to give you a larger score because the, those individual uh, pieces of the application and teams need to be able to separate their, their level of satisfaction with just their piece. Right. Maybe you don't want to separate the larger application in that way. Maybe you do. I, I don't know. I could probably argue either side. So I'm going to, I'm going to quickly move on uh, from that. So to move on to the next section, another measure of engagement, I guess it's an engagement measurement, which is the percentage of healthy account in your application. I worked on an application one time that had millions of registered users. However, on a given day, it only had, well, I mean, I mean only, right. It only had, uh, I don't know, a hundred thousand plus somewhere around there active users. So you could look in the database at the user's last session, or you can look at the sessions and the user's last active date. All that was recorded in the database 
And uh, you could basically tell the number of healthy accounts versus the number of accounts that were maybe they used it one time, they didn't really like it, they kind of abandoned it. So you had a percentage of healthy accounts versus uh, your total users. So in your healthy accounts over your total users times 100 gave you your amount of actual active users in the system and you can take that over different time frames in the last week in the last month you know last week last two weeks last month last two months three months quarterly right and you can get a, a, a percentage now I, I would hope as a product manager i would hope that those numbers are relatively the same in the last week two weeks uh month quarter year i would hope that those numbers don't change really too much but to go back to the original uh, to the the banner level of this discussion. I would hope that 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 you could show that to at a team. Maybe you could show it at a team level. You could show it at a team level because those teams are working on uh, features regardless of which features, which specific features are used in the application. Those are users to everybody, uh, to every team. But that would be one that you could show at a leadership level. I would think you know user uh, number of healthy accounts percentage of healthy accounts in your system. Along those lines of percentage of healthy accounts, another thing that I have seen, especially for mobile apps, there's a huge thing with mobile apps, which is you need to have a, a fairly graceful and easy to use user experience, right? The, like the user experience goes past just like the, the where buttons are on the screen. It's it's really an entire discipline. And I've met and interacted with, with many, many, many people who that's their role, you know, the user experience, really trying to, to get in the headspace of and represent the users as an occupation, you know, as their career. And they've been very good at it. And I've been very lucky to work with those type of people. One of the determinants you can use to, to figure out how well your application is doing with user experience is you can measure transactions, certain transactions. Now you need to code to figure out whether you wanna track backed out transactions, for example. So an application in my, previously in my career, you had to, you would download the app from the app store. It's a mobile application, obviously. You download the app from the app store and you would, there would be a registration, right? You have to put in your email, you have to put in some details or whatever, or create a password, hit submit. In order to do that, there are certain steps that have to be walked through, right? And you go to screen one, you have to put in your email. Then maybe you go to screen two, you put in your name, first name, last name, email address, whatever. Then screen three, maybe you put in your password and then confirmation password and then you hit submit. And then maybe you do some other steps, maybe not, I don't know. But each screen that you get through is a step in the workflow of registering a user for the first time. So these are users that are downloading the application from the app store for the first time and uh, entering some information. And it's it can be very important to know, like at what point do the users just bow out? Like they don't wanna do it anymore. It's too much information, it's too much of a hassle. When we initially developed the application, we were not tracking that. And then along the way, it became important to track that. So we did track it. And as we tracked it, we, we learned that certain screens were very difficult for users to navigate or certain screens took a longer amount of time for users to navigate. I, I would also say, cause I don't know if this is on my list uh, to tackle later on, there are other tools when you're dealing with mobile applications like heat maps, for example, to tell where the user is touching on the screen and how long a user is taking on each screen while they look at it and, and think. And usually when you ask a user for information, the longer, especially the more detailed the information is, the longer they take or think about what they want to enter. So there are plugins that you can use with mobile applications to gather more information. But the, the only thing is some of those, some of those plugins cost you money. Some of, some of them are, are third party, party plugins because you wouldn't want to create things like that from scratch because they would take a good, good, good amount of effort, uh, like heat maps, for example, think of them as, as a, um, think of them as, as gathering information of your app on what what places the user is touching on the screen or how long a user is waiting before they touch something on the screen to tell you when a user first gets to the screen here's where they touch 
So things that may not be buttons or things that may not seem like buttons, maybe they're touching the air, maybe they're touching buttons multiple times, maybe there's some kind of delay. Who knows what you what you might discover. We discovered different things when, when we implemented this in our application. But the, 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 the point of, of me bringing this up is how far a user gets through a certain step in a workflow that you give to a user, like registration, for example, may be important for you. So you can break those individual screens down to say, well, how far does a user get? How long does it take the general user to get through the application registration process? How long does it take an individual user to add a new company? For example, if I have an application and I'm an independent contractor and I can operate for multiple companies, how easy is it for me to add another company to my phone? Like how long does it generally take? And you can reduce that frustration if it takes a while, or if you see users starting the process of going through that and then abandoning it, you want those metrics, right? So those are useful as a, at a team level, but those also would be very useful at a leadership level to know, well, only 20% of people that start on adding a new company to work with complete it. Right. Well, that may indicate that you have a problem in usability. You have a problem in your user experience, or you have a problem in you're asking for some detail of data. And most users either don't have that data or don't have immediate access to it, or they need to call somebody and get it or what, whatever it is. Right. So that would be one metric that that metric is usable. It, it's very useful at a team level because a team might catch it before the leadership catches it. I mean, Honestly, all, all these things would be really useful for a team to catch it before the leadership catches it. That way they can make adjustments and, and fix things before the leadership asks them to make adjustments and fix things. Another one is the health of the backlog. I think I think I touched on this one in the last podcast. The, the health of the backlog would be an indicator probably more useful to whatever whatever internal organization helps manage, control, direct the direction of the product. This is probably a more useful metric for them. But if you are a higher up in the product organization, I could see maybe you would want to bubble this up to the leadership to say that, you know, what is our backlog health look like? Do we have a roadmap that goes out three months, six months, 12 months, like well, how far does our roadmap go ahead of time? And then how much of that roadmap is broken down into actual stories that are estimated and ready to be picked up by teams. So basically how healthy is the backlog that teams are consuming and bringing in and working from? Do they have two, three, four sprints worth of work ready to go at any point for them to absorb? Because a team that basically is only one iteration ahead of what they're working on, there should be some concern there where, you know, we're kind of like working by the seat of our pants in that we don't really know how our work connects into the larger uh, subset of work or the larger direction of the company because work is always brought up at the last minute right? That's, that's a backlog health, right? I think probably you could show that at a team level, like this is the backlog health that our team consumes from, right? If you have a couple different teams that maybe two teams that have one product owner, or maybe two product owners have four teams total, and they all work out of the same backlog, it may be a, a bit stickier to get that type of information. But I think the thing I'm trying to get here is the percentage of work that comes in at the last minute. So the thing that I'm trying to get here and trying to represent to leadership is these, this percentage of our work is based on things that are not planned well ahead of time. They are us reacting to things rather than we are executing on things that we've planned, right? I would expect that this metric directly correlates to product leadership is the product leadership going out and bringing the things that are of business value in and getting the teams to look at them well like well ahead of where the market's at now the, the flip side of this is sometimes things happen and you have to react sometimes some some activity happens in the market and you have to react immediately 100 percent 
okay, no problem, great. However, there should be a normal percentage, some kind of baseline. So if every sprint you're having to stop what you're doing and take things out and bring things back in because the market, you're reacting to the market, or you can never get more than two sprints ahead, or well, two sprints is probably bad. You can never, you can never get more than one sprint ahead because the market keeps changing or the way your company is trying to break into the market keeps changing or you keep getting things from your sales guys or things that are at top importance because you're trying to sell certain customers. Whatever conditions there are, you should have some kind of measure on your backlog health that says, well, these things from our roadmap are things that we've planned versus these things are things that we did not plan. So planned work versus unplanned work. That's probably one that I, I probably could take offline with a product person and, and kind of go through a little bit more in depth because uh, maybe you're in a volatile market where things are changing on a pretty regular, pretty consistent basis. And maybe that's not a great thing to measure. I, I probably could go either way, but I would expect that, that if you were in a stable market, that that number of the amount of things that you have to react to and jump in, you know, that jump the line in front of everything else on a regular basis, that that, that would be a fairly consistent and low number, you know, definitely not above 50%. I would expect it to be a, a generally like 25% or lower makeup. Thinking about backlog, I would, I would say it probably would be easy at both the team level and the leadership level to display the metric of the features that you implement. What percentage of the features that you implement are based on features, actual feature roadmap features that are off of your roadmap versus technical objectives, technical deliverables, I would say. So basically what is coming from the business versus what is coming from the technical side? I, I, I think maybe that would be useful to see, you could see that at a team level, most certainly, because your team puts in a certain amount of effort trying to implement features, and your team puts in a certain amount of effort trying to make the environment or make the, the features themselves more efficient technically, especially if your team is the one implementing, like, for example, DevOps pipelines and parameterizing a code that was not previously parameterized. For example, improving CI CD functions of your application so it's easier to deploy, like th things that, that are not necessarily feature development, in meaning you're giving more value to the end user feature development. Although it could be argued that making it easier to deploy your software, it does give value to the end users. I'm specifically talking about separating each story into one of the following categories, which is either uh, business or architectural. And the only reason I bring that up is because I know for a fact that uh, built in out of the box, Azure DevOps has the, the business and architectural dropdown in value area. So what I'm talking about now is just using that when you're dealing with your stories. So. Um, at the end of a sprint, if you use that dropdown, you can get a percentage of, well, of this sprint for my team, what, what percentage of my story points for all my user stories all aggregate together were business versus uh, technical or architectural. And then you can roll that number up across all of your teams. If you have like four or five, six teams, or whatever, you can roll that number up to the program level and you can represent that to leadership to say that, you know, X percentage of our development efforts are dealing with features versus X percentage is dealing with making sure that the underlying architecture and the underlying, so like some frameworks call this architectural runway is, is moving us forward to the future. That shouldn't be viewed as wasted effort. I mean, that, that, that should be viewed as a, a constant, you know, uh, you want, you want the, that constant architectural hand on the wheel to making sure that your code is being made more efficient and your environments are being kept stable and your database is being kept optimized and that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't expect to see that number spike go up and down too much. I would expect just a general, like my, my general throughput to stay generally pretty steady to know that I am keeping my hand on the wheel of both getting features to customers, getting new functionality in customers' hands, 
and making sure that the efficiency of my technology somebody is looking at actively right and that we probably could talk about that one in an entirely separate podcast so i'm gonna kind of move along out of that one but the inside of the inside of the technical slash architectural bucket i would also i would also think about include the bug fixes like major bug fixes or maybe i would say i'm not 100 percent certain on that i, I could be convinced either way on, on, on what to do with that but with a, a number that i would look at and this is both at a team level and at a leadership level a number that i would look at it would be a uh, bug leakage it's called leakage which is a terrible term what a terrible term leakage is the number of bugs that are discovered by customers and not by our internal test team or internal test automation or, or or some sort of representative thereof. You want to know the number of bugs being discovered by your outside users, by, by users to your software, right? I don't see a reason to not expose this at, at both levels, at the team level, the individual team level, and then roll all of your leak detection bugs up to a higher level uh, over the program. Or maybe a couple different programs together, you know, all together. Although I, I think it's probably more important to segment them in each program because this, this, this will be a direct reflection on your engineering efforts, your engineering efficiency. I would say both, both QA and development because together they represent. Because if you, if your engineering is just throwing things over the fence to QA and expecting manual tests to discover all of your bugs. Like you have an old school mentality and, and you kind of need to, to think about what you're doing there. For I'm not like, I know that's going to come off as accusatory, but it's really not meant to be. Again, there's another category where we probably could spend the entire podcast discussing, you know, probably could spend the entire podcast discussing bugs and how you track bugs and the different categories of tracking bugs as they come back in and 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 the, the only thing i will say about bugs is like i i worked at a fairly small company one time and they tracked bugs in that they were things reported from users as not operating correctly but they didn't really have a great triage process for the bugs that that came in right so it's triage what i mean by triage is when a bug is reported it doesn't really matter who it's reported from right it could be reported from an external user so any user in the field that calls support hey i'm doing this and i think it's a problem you know help me out a bug could be something that someone finds inside of the testing cycle so a new feature is introduced and someone is looking at a requirement and says oh when you click here it's supposed to do xyz and i only see it doing uh, yz and not x so that's a bug you know so an internally report a bug and then a, a bug could be a problem because s s some data got purged and an application is not handling it anymore and somebody doesn't think that that's right so basically there are there are there are categories that bugs can fall into right and this is what i mean by triage uh, triage is somebody from the business needs to make a decision of I, I've looked into the bug, I've looked at the, the, the software as it relates to what you're reporting, and I've decided that the bug falls into this category. So bug triage categories, like if you could say, well, this is, you know, the user is clicking this in this order, so that's the reason why they're seeing this strange behavior, and that's what we expect. So it could be a user, it could be a user issue, an operator, operator error type of issue. They could see something because maybe somebody has mess with some data or somebody has changed some data in a certain way so it could be an issue with the underlying data in the database so we just need to look at the database and scrub that data and then the bugs go away i've seen that in in a significant uh way in, in past places that i've worked i've also seen that uh, certain paths through the application are not handled very well but then it very well could be a legitimate bug some, something that no one has thought of before so that would be a, a, a legitimate uh, point so even bug leakage needs to be split into smaller subcategories to tell me exactly what's the problem so exactly what is the problem so is the problem i don't understand how my users are progressing through the application is the problem i don't understand how my users are using the data that they have in my application or is the problem is my users don't understand how I intend them to walk through the application. So e even even bug leakage needs its own triage process to, 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 to walk through and, and kind of quantify that data before it rolls up to leadership. Because I, I, I feel that 
just rolling bug leakage by itself up to the leadership level, that's kind of setting yourself up for, um, it's kind of setting yourself up for a world of hurt because they're going to ask a ton of questions and you need to be prepared to walk through those scenarios, right? And, and, and not only walk through those scenarios, but also tell them what you're doing to mitigate those scenarios in the future. Again, we probably could do an entire session and that may, that may be one that, that I need to have somebody in from, from testing or from QA to, to, to walk through with as well. The Final category that I'll I'll try to to tackle here is is metrics. So I've kind of split things in the session into team metrics versus metrics that you roll up to the leadership, and um, we haven't really placed anything on the. I mean, we placed a few things on the managers in that we give them statistics, we give them things that we are measuring, and it's assumed that they're dealing with these things. But in the broader category of we're we're going through an agile transformation and we decide that we want to change behaviors. Okay. We want to get certain outcomes from our teams, right? We're going to give things to the managers and assume that they're working at a leadership level. They're, they're, they're working towards what the leadership level wants them to work towards with regard to behaviors. So how do we measure that they actually are moving towards the behaviors that we want? Well, that's a huge open-ended question, right? One, one, which is way past, where I want to get into at this point, because I'll just, I'll ramble on for another 30 minutes and I'd rather not do that. But one of the things, one of the actual quantifiable mechanics that we can get to is, well, how many, how, well, what is the percentage of your team members that you've sent a training on this, on this topic? So for example, if you're saying, well, I want everyone to understand the basics of scrum, well, what is the percentage of your team that you've sent to CSM training? You know, for example, because it's, it's a two day training, right? It's a minimal cost. So it shouldn't be that big of a deal to send your development team to CSM. So if, if I have a, a, a manager who's over five, six, seven development teams or uh, more in reality, if I have a delivery lead who's over like 20 development teams, like what percentage of the scrum masters that work under those delivery leads have actually gone and gotten their CSM certification? That would be something that I think about measuring. Now you need some sort of engagement at a leadership level to measure that type of thing, because that's a very niche specific thing. I, in fact, I would take it a step further. I would say, well, if we're, you could do this with Kanban as well, but let's just choose Scrum to have a, a concrete example. So what percentage of your Scrum masters that are on your teams have, have are CSM certified? What percentage of your product owners are CSPO certified or PSPO? slash whatever, whatever you, whatever designation you decide on. And then you can get a percentage with the, with the goal, of course, the goal being hundred percent. And, um, you could do the same thing for testers, for, for developers and, and, and whatnot, but there, there are, there are team level metrics you can get to under an individual manager. We'll call them managers at this point. And those can easily roll up to a leadership level to sort of prove that your mid-level managers in this example that I've given the, the delivery lead would be like a mid-level manager. Your mid-level managers are taking the direction of leadership seriously. Meaning, So you could compare it. So, well, all the teams under manager A have a 80% rate of training and all the teams under manager B have a 40% rate of training. Well, I mean, at the point where you see just those pure numbers, maybe you want to ask more questions. Okay. Well, why have you not trained your teams, right? Why are you not looking into these things? You know, and maybe there's budgetary reasons or other reasons There could be other, there could be legitimate reasons, but then again, there could not be. So these basic metrics, like I feel we've gone through about, I don't know, eight categories, 10 categories of of metrics, how they may roll up to a, a to a team level, and and if and if they can roll up to a leadership level or aggregate from a team level to a leadership level, I feel that pretty important to look at. I mean, it, the issue why we can't standardize everything, and I completely understand that we can't, is because the things that teams look at cannot necessarily be compared to other teams. However, they may be able to be aggregated up to a leadership level, so the leadership can get a broad view of how the entire organization is is adopt the, the change or the direction 
or the, 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 I mean, you can call it a mandate as well. I like to think of it more as a direction when you're dealing with leadership. The, the, the desire to move into a direction, you know, is do you have buy in from the uh, team levels? Because it's, it's any agile transformation or really any change management at all. Does it's, I mean, like, I, I say agile transformation because that, that's in my expertise, but any change management you have to come at it from both sides you have to come at it from the leadership side so a top-down approach and you have to come at it from a grassroots bottom-up type of approach and the most successful endeavors will deal with both at the same time so there'll be some coaching up here at the top level and you'll have some change agents operating up here at the top level and you'll have agents operating at the bottom level going up and that's kind of what you need to have all your factors for success in place in my opinion again my opinion uh, i i would look forward to to comments and uh, your comment on the issue and and what you've seen so you can comment below uh, or you can write your comments in to agile podcast questions at gmail either or i'd be very happy to hear what you have to say on this topic